let's also talk about athletes cashing in. Superstar sports agent Lee Steinberg certainly knows a lot about that topic and is the man who served as the real life inspiration for Jerry Maguire. He's currently chairman of Steinberg Sports and Entertainment and is the author of new book, The Agent, My 40-Year Career of Making Deals and Changing the Game. He's indeed made many deals, securing billions of dollars over the years for more than 300 clients, including my man, Mr. Patrick Mahomes. And we had the privilege of catching up with Lee recently, and we started asking him why we're seeing such big money contracts. What happened is that in the midst of a cratered economy and the pandemic, CBS and Fox went ahead and negotiated contracts with the NFL that virtually doubled what the last contract had paid. And that was $200 million per team per season. So by the end of this, before they open their doors, NFL teams will be getting about $350 million. So they are a wash in revenue coming from fantasy sports, from brand new stadia with luxury boxes from massive TV contracts. And previous to this off season, the privileged positions had been left tackle that uh, protects the quarterback, the quarterback always, and quarterbacks are now making what mm. baseball and basketball players are making, uh, a shutdown corner and a defensive end that could put the quarterback on its back. So those four positions, but this offseason, wide receivers broke into the stratosphere. And so we now have five privileged positions. Yeah. Well, Lee, I mean, you have to expand on that for me. This has certainly been the offseason of the wide receiver. I mean, Devontae Adams, you know, Cooper Cup, uh, Debo Samuel, um, A.J. Brown, you name it, you know. Talk to us about the front offices. How can they justify paying the wide receiver position at that magnitude and still be able to build a title contender? Because what teams do is they define the five or six players that are irreplaceable on a team. And what happens is it's the same income inequality that we see in the rest of the economy. So the quarterback might make 40 to $50 million, uh, Patrick Mahomes, a Deshaun Watson, a Josh Allen. The left tackle, the wide receiver, the gifted uh, sack uh, master on the defensive <laughs> line, and the backups at every position are making the minimum. Yeah. And so they have to decide who is modular, fungible, and replaceable, and those players are getting the minimum. Mm -hmm. And then we're seeing six or seven players that are breaking out but the money's there. It's a salary cap sport. And so owners are, are paying money they have that they're making. This country's obsessed with professional football. 71 of the top 100 television shows last year were NFL football. It's not only the most popular sport, it's the most popular form of televised entertainment. Yeah, I spend way more time watching TV on Sundays, probably more in aggregate than I spend on any given month in when it's not football season. You were just talking about the quarterbacks, like Pat Mahomes, who is one of your clients. 2020 signs a 10-year, $450 million deal. At the time, that made him the highest paid on an average annual basis of any player, and now he's already been upstaged by Aaron Rodgers, Deshaun Watson. It seems like the bar just keeps getting set higher. If that's the case and they just continually ratchet it up, why sign a long-term deal? Because what happens in a cap system is that eventually, since all salary counts against the cap and bonus counts in an amortized way, a few years into one of those big contracts, the team will come to that player and try to redo the contract, reduce the salary, and extend it. So um, in a case like Mahomes, what you're telling the team is, I want to be here. This is my team. And, um, but there's really not much risk that a franchise quarterback that in a quarterback centric league is ever going to end up under salary. So, um, and a player who's making 40, $50 million, um, even though there will be players come along and sign bigger contracts is 
not exactly heard of. What are your thoughts about players serving as brand ambassadors, getting sponsorships from the sports books directly? I mean, you don't see many players out there advertising, I don't know, doing beer commercials or cigarette commercials. You know, what are your thoughts about them serving as brand ambassadors for sport books? I, again, don't have a big problem with it as long as it's not the players themselves um, who are betting and getting involved with, uh, with gamblers. Um, we've known that people bet forever. Um, do we want kids betting large amounts of money? No, we really want to police that. But, and these are difficult questions. Uh, but at the same time, we know that this is going on. It's, look, when you hear a game that's out of hand and there's a touchdown scored and there's tumultuous celebration in the stands, we've known for some time that's about point spread, right? And so it's never been a secret that people bet like crazy and it's part of the reason we have a popularity of sport. As long as the athletes themselves are not involved in the wagering, um, I don't have a big problem with it. Sports betting, what this show is about, is presenting difficulties to professional leagues in that there are players who would like to invest in sports books. There are players who would like to gamble on games themselves. How do you view how sports betting is changing the game and ultimately how these leagues should be policing that? I think that that um, impregnable wall between betting has been breached because we now have teams and leagues that are buying into the DraftKings of the world. You see ads for Indian casinos. Uh, the one thing we can't have happen is athletes betting on their own teams and their own games in a way where they become compromised. And you have gamblers that have leverage over players. And then you have fans start to question whether or not the games are fixed because once that happens, if there's doubt over whether games are played on an even playing field, it becomes wrestling. And that will destroy the integrity. As to the rest of it, um, we, have, uh, we have a number of teams in Las Vegas, and that doesn't seem to be compromising integrity. And I think very soon we'll see paramutual betting where you can go into a football stadium and bet on which team wins the coin flip and who uh, runs the ball back first and who scores the first touchdown. And again, as long as it's not players or coaches or executives doing it on their own team, I think that the sports will survive. You just cannot have fans doubting whether the games are played on even playing fields. Finally, obviously, we've talked mostly about players in the professional realm, but with name, image, and likeness and the changes in the NCAA, there is now a whole league of amateur athletes who are opened up to this world. How does the NIL change change things for college athletes and their expectations when they do enter the professional leagues? Well, it's a revolution, and it's happened very rapidly in the course of a year. In football, it's three years until from, from when someone graduates uh, from high school until they can come into the pros. So I'd be talking to uh, a junior and his parents. Now, all of a sudden, if you can't spot a talent as a high school junior and sign him to an NIL and someone else does, you may never have a chance to represent him in the pros. So you're going to see branding and athletes involved in marketing themselves with marketing agents younger and younger and younger. Amazing. You're going to see it move back uh, uh, to earlier and earlier age. So, so much for the concept of amateurism and the currency in all this is going to be how many followers does someone have on Twitter and, and TikTok and Instagram and commercialization at a much younger age. And 
the side effect that people weren't anticipating is how this affects college recruiting because we have collectives that are happening with alums at all sorts of colleges where they're getting together and now telling a young recruit, a 17-year-old, you come to this college or this college and you can uh, be guaranteed $2 million in endorsement money. 